good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this g20 panel discussion on um, a very important book written by one of our senior fellows titled social and economic policies to reduce poverty in latin america which has got the honor of being translated into spanish with the title políticas sociales y económicas para reducir la pobreza in america latina by the national university of mexico for the discussion on this book we have the privilege of having as uh, chief guest his excellency mr federico salas lotfe the honorable ambassador of mexico to india i extend a very warm welcome to him we also have the pleasure of having with us professor sarthi acharya of institute for human development professor acharya has conducted development and research collaborative research with national and overseas partners including with the world bank adb united nations agencies the population council and state governments in india among others so we are very happy to have him with us as a discussant this afternoon and of course i extend a very warm welcome to professor santosh merotra who is a development economist he is a senior fellow at nmml as of now but he is also visiting professor at the center for development bath university uk and this is something relevant to the discussion today he has uh, taken deep interest in the economic development of latin american countries over the last three decades he has traveled to almost all of them since 1995 to provide professional advice to governments as a un development economist we have also the pleasure of having our director shri sanjeev nandan sahay who retired as a power secretary to the government of india he has very kindly consented to formally chair today's program so i thank him and i welcome him to this program with these few words i would uh, like to request since this of course is not a officially a book release but since we have the we have five copies of the book here and as i said that this is a rare uh, honor for a book written on this subject to be translated into spanish by a mexican university and in this case the most uh, famous uh, university of mexico may i request all those who are present here on the panel to uh, stand up for a photo opportunity which can be regarded as a release of the book as far as the spanish world is concerned I would now like to invite Professor Santosh Merotra to introduce the book to us in about fourteen uh, fifteen minutes. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Ravi Mishra, the Deputy Director of Nehru Memorial, um, Excellency uh, Ambassador Salas, and uh, my good colleagues uh, right here in Nehru Memorial, Mr. Sahai. Ravi and of course uh, Professor Sarathi Acharya and all my good colleagues all around the room thank you very much indeed for coming and thanks to all the uh, distinguished uh, guests from the Latin American embassies who've kindly consented to to be present uh, look forward to engaging with you 
about the book and other things, I guess, over the high tea, which has been kindly arranged by Nehru Memorial. So don't think about rushing away. Please stay um, for a cup of tea with us uh, after the event. Um, so you may well ask the question, um, why would an Indian economist be writing a book about Latin America, and what makes him so, so, uh, e so competent to even think about writing a book on, on Latin America? One reason, of course, was provided by Ravi when he told you that I've been visiting the continent from, since 1994. I should tell you that uh, when the tequila crisis happened in December of 1994, Ambassador, I was actually in Cancun holidaying there and saw how the currency collapsed as a result of uh, a multiplicity of factors, some of which I will uh, have make reference to. And since then, I've had the great privilege of returning to that continent and to those countries. And I would, I would bet my bottom dollar, I have a feeling, ambassadors, that uh, I would probably have been to more of the Latin American countries than you, you might have been. That's probably what gives me the the, the, the confidence to have written this. But apart, apart from that, of course, intellectually, it's a, it's a region which has always uh, uh, enormously interested me for the, fo for the following reason. Uh, because here is a continent which has been independent of its colonial masters for about 200 years. You know, the rest of Asia, Africa became independent of the rest of, the, of their colonial masters only in the last 70 or 80 odd years. So one would have expected by now much of Latin America, because it, you became independent roughly within 50 years of the United States, and then one would have expected by now you would all be rich countries, like North America. But you haven't quite got there. And this is something that has bothered me no end from the beginning. And I, therefore, it sort of led me, led my intellectual curiosity, and you see some of my understanding reflected here, and of course, I look forward to your views on this. Um, I'm going to be, I have only 11 slides, so I'm going to try and present a book which is sort of about 150 pages in uh, 11 slides, and let me see how I succeed. Uh, but I just want to add one thing, that you can see that the subtitles here, subtitle here saying reducing poverty in Latin America, applying a dual synergies model, which I'll refer to in a minute, to Latin America to draw lessons from Asia. Actually, the book subtitle is, Are There Lessons from Asia? That's what really led me to write the book, Are There Lessons from Asia? What is it that sort of was different? Even though much of Asia was, was uh, colonized and became independent only in the last 70, 75 years, so I would say. So what's this dual synergies model, which I begin the book with? In the first two chapters, in fact, deal with precisely this, and you'll see I'll be very brief because it's a sort of, uh, I've, I've done a theoretical analysis of this in, in the book, but also in a, in a book on India, because this is an econ uh, a conceptual framework which I've developed, which I've tested econometrically, at least for using Indian data, Indian states. I haven't done the econometric, econometric uh, analysis for, for Latin America, but you'll see that this uh, synergies framework actually dominates my entire presentation and actually drives the whole book. You see in the three boxes at the, at the ends of the triangle, economic growth, income poverty reduction, human capabilities, at the macroeconomic level, these are all desirable objectives that most developing countries aim at. And notice also the arrows running between each one of these in both directions. And this is very important to the analysis, uh, because what, what essentially this is saying is that, what essentially this is saying is that economic growth has, has a, obviously a major impact on income poverty reduction, but income poverty reduction is, very impo is an important determinant of economic growth. And similarly, Income poverty reduction determines human capabilities or human capital formation at the macro level, just as human capability levels of a society impact income poverty reduction. And finally, you will see arrows running uh, in both directions between economic growth and human capabilities. The theoretical sort of bases are explained in the in 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 in, in this diagram, but I don't think I need to go through this. I expect you to intuitively go along with me 
um, because I will try and demonstrate this empirically, these three relationships and how and why, what are the reasons why these three relationships don't really work very well in Latin America. I'm not claiming that they'd work very well in India. I've made a presentation in this very room about precisely that. Uh, so, so all I'm saying is that by comparison, in a, in a large number of East Asian and Southeast Asian countries, they tended to work rather well. I'll move on beyond this very quickly. So where can we locate these formulations in development theory or in, in economic theory? First, of course, I locate my analysis of the Latin American region in, uh, and, and, and other countries, including India, in the capabilities approach associated with the Nobel Prize winning economists, Sen and, of course, the philosopher uh, Martha Nussbaum. The second um, uh, sort of theoretical driving force here is more re something more recent, new growth theory associated with the Nobel Prize winning economists, uh, Romer and Lucas. And finally, to some extent, the analysis is driven by uh, my concern with public policy, but which has roots in institutional economics. So these are the sort of the three the uh, theoretical sources uh, which are sort of uh, forces which are driving this book. But So now let me turn to the application to Latin America, looking at the, the growth poverty relationship, right? That was the first one you recall on the right-hand side, uh, which we, and why I believe in my view this relationship is relatively weak, uh, which I am, of course, am examined empirically. You see, the, we all know that lack I'm use, going to use the term lack, Latin American and Caribbean countries. The, the pattern of growth historically in, in the lack countries has been an extractive industry-based model. And the lack countries are exporting essentially primarily, uh, pr uh, primary commodities, uh, particularly you know, as much as two-thirds of total exports, believe it or not, two-thirds are accounted for by primary commodities, which is surprising for countries which are all almost entirely in the upper middle income category. Almost entirely in the upper middle income category. In fact, if you look at the, the, the range of countries between uh, the upper middle income countries are those between $4,000 per, per person per annum and $12,000 per person per annum. I'm rounding off some numbers. Most of them are actually in the up, upper range of that median. Of the, of the medium of that range from 4,000 to 12,000, most of the Latin American. And yet, highly primary commodity dependent. And in fact, you know, one, one way that this has, this has turned out is that since about 2000, Latin America has increased inflow of, has had increased inflow of foreign direct investment, especially in um, natural resources. In fact, uh, I mean, it would, it would, it really, when I started to su study this, I didn't quite realize how, how heavy is the dependence on primary commodity exports. In 1990s, the exports of primary commodities as a percentage of total exports um, was about 67% in 1990, but it was falling in the last decade of the last century to 41%. But with rising FDI, uh, since about 2000, it has increased again to 61%. So in other words, you... We started about 30 years ago with a heavy dependence on primary commodities. And post-2008, uh, post-2008 global economic crisis, the FDI flows to Latin America have actually gone on peaking. Just as, just as post-global uh, uh, economic crisis, FDI in the rest of the world was falling. Here in Latin America, it was increasing. Um, and so, you know, this shows how important Latin America's uh, exports of, of uh, metals are to the rest of the world. And when you add on the agricultural production with oil, gas, and metals, they remain central to the region's exports. So I offer, offer you sort of five reasons why this growth poverty relationship in Latin America has tended to be weak. The first reason is that what is the first reason what is under, underly, undermining the link from growth to poverty reduction is that in this model, which is extractive, fewer jobs are created. In all extractive models, fewer jobs are created. And <clears throat> uh, you know, unlike in manufacturing, 
where you can generate sufficient number of jobs where you may wish to. Here, it's an enclave type development located physically where the natural resources are. And it's another important and interesting finding that I had was that labor receives less in capital intensive extraction. And most, most extraction is actually, you find that labor receives less because it tends to be capital intensive. I mean, for, for instance, and this makes it very, rather different from, uh, from, from East Asia, Southeast Asia. So for instance, labor receives less than 10% of world market value of exported minerals, 6% in the case of Argentina and Chile, and 1.2% in Mexico. So in other words, even when exports are booming, so for instance, you're not, you know, the labor is not doing so well. So after four years of ex booming exports from 2002 to 2006, the index of value of real wages in the extractive sector grew by only 0.5%. Now, <coughs> contrast this to a development model in East Asia, Southeast Asia, where there is labor-seeking FDI, supported by human development investment and industrialization. And so you have, in, in this kind of pattern in East and Southeast Asia, the share of labor that is wages and salaries in the social product, that is income derived from the production process, is much higher. It's 60%. Well, in, I said for the Latin American countries, it's less than 10%, which obviously has you know, positive outcomes. And, and, and this situation is actually made worse by something else. Because we all know that the 1980s and 90s were neoliberal times. But then in 21st century, post-neoliberalism came. And due to social movements in Latin America, many countries saw regimes change and shift. And there was a shift towards the left to, to progressive extractiv extractivism. And while this was happening, unfortunately, came the global 2008 crisis, which stopped that process. So what you saw, in fact, is, in, is, is, is <clears throat> that primary commodity prices collapse again. And once the primary commodity prices collapse again, you get, again, the impact on labor. Um, so what are we saying? This kind of export-oriented, extractive-based model is heavily dependent upon the international market and hence, it's vulnerable to exogenous shocks. In a way that the manufacturing prowess of the East stations has prevented them from being equally uh, vulnerable to exogenous shocks. Um, and we all know, <coughs> we all know that, we, we, I've already said this, that labor receives less in capital in, intensive extraction. I could sort of develop this, but I, I, I won't in the interest of time. The fact of the matter is that on account of that great vulnerability, you find that between 1980 and 2000, per capita income, and this is, of course, a combination of the neoliberal policies, thanks to the, to the, uh, the, the imposition of those policies uh, willy-nilly, uh, with some support, obviously, from domestic regimes by the World Bank and the Washington Consensus and the International <coughs> Monetary Fund, you get almost no growth in per capita terms. Because if income, if uh, per capita, if, if population is growing at about 1% per annum, and per capita income for the 1980s and 1990s is growing at 1% one, at, at 1 per annum, you get practically no per capita income growth. Uh, th for two decades, you get two lost two, two loss decades. Uh, and when the growth begins in, the, in this century, Suddenly, that process is stopped in, by, on account of the 2008 crisis. In other words, poverty was beginning to decline in this century, but that process stops after 2008. So <clears throat> I mean, I, I demonstrate this through, through, through data. So a sort of third dimension of this relationship being weak is the fact that, obviously, uh, 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 
it's, it's, it's similar, it, just as you have heavy dependence on primary commodities, it also shows that the share of manufacturing and employment is low. Cons for countries at this level of per capita income, it, it's surprising. It was 12.5% in tw 2010 in Latin America, and it fell to 11.7 by 2017. Um, and be believe it or not, manufacturing share of GDP in, in 1990 was 196 that also can, you know, systematically falls. Now, all this is you know, complete contrast to the Southeast Asian and the Asian, which have much higher levels of manufacturing in both output and, and, uh, and, and employment. Now, there is another implication of all of this, and that is the following, that the low poverty responsiveness or the poverty elasticity of growth in Latin America is also due to the high share of informality in the workforce. You see, the extractive model, as I've been suggesting, generates few jobs in the formal sector. And when few jobs are being generated in the formal sector, clearly the implication is going to be that for this level of per capita income, you know, the upper end of high, of upper middle income, um, you have very high levels of informality, not dissimilar from the Southeast Asians. Of course, not as high as in India, but high. And then, you know, since earnings from labor are a major source of incomes, when you have volatility in growth, as I've been indicating, over the last 30 years, that has also impacted employment. employment. And of course, with the rate of informality being as high for the level of per capita income, you, 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 know, you shouldn't be surprised that the, poli policy, the poverty responsiveness of growth is low. Um, finally, the final reason is that the one remaining sector that we've not sort of discussed is agriculture. Well, of course, which accounts for a relatively small proportion of total employment, uh, as well as GDP in most of those countries. But the agriculture is also heavily capital intensive. Huh? except, of course, among indigenous farming communities. So when you have this kind of combination of factors, even when you begin to get growth, you don't get to see the, the responsiveness uh, of poverty to, to growth that you would like to see happen. Let me turn to the second relationship, the growth-human capital relationship, and why I argue in the book why this is weak in Latin America. So the first point is that we all know from international evidence, and even from theory, that human capital formation is ultimately dependent upon state investments. And private sector in health and education, we all know in all countries, caters to the well-off and not to the majority. But the state's capacity in most lack, lack countries to invest in health and education or in economic infrastructure is, of course, dependent on the fiscal capacity of the state, which requires both sustained GDP growth, which I think I've already talked about, why it's been low, and, and also, of course, it depends upon the tax-to-GDP ratio. It depends upon the tax-to-GDP ratio. Now, with volatile growth, the capacity of the state to spend is, is really quite limited due to a relatively low tax-to-GDP ratio. And it's, I mean, it's quite surprising if you look at the data. It, it's, I, I had known this for about 25 years, and there's been very little improvement, or though there has been in most recent years, very little improvement in the tax to GDP. The tax to GDP ratio is only as high in most Latin American countries as in, as in India, which is a low middle income country. Our per capita income is, is $2,200. Uh, but I'm saying the vast majority of lakh countries are upper middle income, because India has a per capita income of only a third or a fourth of, of Brazil or Latin America. Now, by contrast, most Southeast Asian states invested early in the development process in both school education and basic health. In fact, I sort of did a book some 25 years ago, which is called Development with a Human Face, Face published by uh, Clarendon Press Oxford, and where essentially I do case studies of this. And, and they sustained growth throughout the 80s and the 90s, partly based on the investment in human capital in the beginning, and of course, 
the labor-seeking FDI that came in and ended up becoming the factory of the world. So what am I saying here? Going back to the dual synergies model, there is a cause and effect of sustained human capital formation, which underpins the growth, uh, the GDP growth, the two-way synergy that I began by talking about. Um, now, there's another dimension that I don't think often is often discussed in the LAC uh, context, which is that the fiscal capacity in the last analysis is impacted by the pattern, especially of financial development. What do I mean by that? See, the financial system in Latin America is dominated by foreign-owned banks, which always used to strike me each time I would go back, which is in complete contrast to countries across most of Asia, not just in India, but across most of Asia. Why is this a problem? Because, you see, a banking system could, um, in principle, a banking system could, in principle, you know, bankers, yeah, I, I, I'm going to finish, <clears throat> could be either in the public sector or the private sector. And when you have a large number of banks in the, which are not only private, but which are foreign-owned, then there's no interest, by and large, of most foreign banks in financial inclusion. That means you're not being able to mobilize savings of the vast majority of the population. You've got, in Mexico, for instance, and just by way of example, 35 to 40 percent of, uh, of the population which has bank accounts, which is sort of roughly half of what it is in India, it's, it, and the same. Uh, so you've got a situation where, because savings are low, the investment rates are low, so the state's capacity itself to continue to invest is, is weak. And savings rates are also 10 to 15 percentage points lower in most Latin American countries than in Asian countries. I, I don't have the time to go into two. Let me very quickly turn to the last relationship. And this is my penultimate slide. <coughs> uh, after this, I just turn, I have one more slide. Why is this third relationship, the hum growth and human capital relationship, relatively weak? Well, savings, as I said, in LAC tend to be poor relative to the per capita income. Gross public savings are only a third of emergent uh, Asian economies, while private savings are 69% of advanced economies and only 57% of, of Asian economies. Now, what this is implying is that there is with sort of, I think I'm going to move on very quickly, sorry. What this is implying is that you've, you've, we've built up over a period of time, for a variety of reasons, high inequality and relatively stable levels of poverty, although declining in the earlier part of the century, but then going back up. Now, when you have high levels of inequality, the relationship between human capital and poverty also is undermined because it keeps household private spending on health and education low, the state's capacity to spend on health and education is limited, and we've got a vicious cycle here in place. And finally, and this is really, really troubling, I'm sure, to the current policymakers, as public spending is constrained on account of the low savings, low tax to GDP ratio, what about the emerging problem of aging? Latin America's dem demographic dividend is over, just as it is over for China. And the countries, all of them, I mean, Brazil's demographic dividend gave over only about four or five years ago, and for most of the countries, the dividend is over. So we have an additional problem staring policymakers, which is aging. And the society needs to increase spending on two new issues which will emerge as aging takes over. First, health services for the aging, and more on social insurance and on pensions for the elderly. And please remember, in a context where 55 to 60 percent of the workers could be informal, 35 to 40 only are formal who have social insurance. So India will also face this risk in about 15 years' time. I don't think we are giving it sufficient attention. Given this, 
we can see again how, why the relationship between human capital formation and poverty is weak. So what do we take away from all of this? And this is my last slide. I just wanted to draw your attention to <clears throat> three or four things which uh, the book concludes with. First, clearly, we finally need to reduce dependence on extraction. Countries need an industrial policy um, which creates jobs, raises wage labor's share in, in total, total surplus, reduces the effects to external shocks, as I've been which is a clear lesson emerging from the East Asian countries. Secondly, on the growth human capital implications, to raise fiscal capacity of the state to spend more on health, education, social transfers, we need to begin to mobilize new forms of direct taxation, which will also, of course, reduce inequality. I'm not for a moment underestimating the political economy challenges involved here, but at the same time, it's just something that all policymakers need to think of. And more reliance on domestic banks, also to be able to mobilize savings to invest, because you're not being able to mobilize the savings. Your savings to GDP ratio is low. When your savings are low, investment rates are low, so growth rates are low. It's a vicious cycle. <clears throat> and therefore, much stronger encouragement to domestic banks to be able to spread financial inclusion to increase savings to invest. And finally, on the Last relationship, well, all of this, if we did this, the first three things could increase allocations to health and education because the demographic dividend is over. Aging has become, begun. I mean, the informal workers also need to be provided social insurance, just as they need to be provided social insurance in our own country in the next 10 to 15 years, before the age. In our country, the window of opportunity still exists. In your region, you may have a window of opportunity for a few more years, but that requires urgent policy action. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I would now like to request Professor Sarthi Acharya to make his remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mishra, Excellency, Mr. Sahai Chairman. Uh, I would start with a, with a very small anecdote. Recently in the U.S., I was in a meeting where I, a question was asked, who is the wealthy? And the answer was, many people said bank balance, this, that. But it was one person who said, the one who has the capabilities is the person who is wealthy, because he or she can create wealth and destroy wealth and create newer things. I think that is the essence of human development, building human capacities. And Santosh's book really addresses human development in the context of how to create capacities among people, different capacities. There are capacities in engineering, sciences, technology, or in governance, which is so important, banking, it's skills good education, and human health. I've read his earlier books as well, and uh, I've, I've known him since the last 40 years, where uh, the notion of human development has undergone change from just being a measure of three indicators to a range of other things, which is now a full-fledged paradigm. And in this context, uh, I think the book which he's talked about his, its earlier version really came about, came about, I think, about 10 years back when I had read the English version of it. Of course, I don't read Spanish. So if it's updated, I would put it this way. Even the book which was written 10 years back is as relevant today as it was then. So this is, I would say, congratulations to uh, Santosh for having said this. The one thing I would like to talk about here is what is development. And I did manage to hear a lecture by a Princeton professor, Atif Mia, who said one of the key problems of Pakistan is that it has outsourced its development. So one is not supposed to outsource development. It's not the others who would do it. So to talk about multinationals coming and creating capital here, 
try to expect externals to come and provide us technology. That is something where Latin America had horribly gone wrong. It is basically that we have to create our own capacities within this country, within, within each country, to have a niche where, OK, only I could do this, nobody else can do it. Taiwan has said it. Taiwan has said 90% of the chips, computer chips, are to be manufactured in Taiwan. Everybody else has to buy it through there. So that is really what the essence of human development is. Create capacities, create niches, so that one has capacities to bargain with others, even in times which are economically or socially difficult. So the key points he has talked about, basic social services. Unfortunately, majority of our countries, I'm talking about the countries in South, uh, the South world, we've concentrated excessively on higher education. We talked about our best universities, we talked about IITs, or we talked about equal institutions uh, in other countries, but we don't talk about how good our municipal schools are. We don't talk about how our village schools are, where we have serious problems. I don't want to go into those problems, but all of you know what they are. And they, we have very serious problems there. The other thing which he's talked about is how much of manufacturing or economic activity is really human value adding. And this is something which I had learned back when I was a student in Warsaw, that it is not important to have raw materials like in the Middle East. It is more important to see whether our people can create wealth. It is not the wealth which we dig from the un underground. It is important which, which comes in from human effort. And this is where Japan comes in, which has virtually no uh, raw materials, but it's among the top performers in the world. The second point which he talked about is equally as important, uh, equity and equality. Unfortunately, he didn't talk about equity, he did talk about inequality. Uh, but I think inequity is equally as important. That means people differentiating against one, one against the other based on e other than economic criteria, like it could be gender, it could be race, it could be color, and so on and so forth. And here, the fundamental point he's talked about is land reform. And I would go a little beyond that into saying beyond that land reform, it's also reformation of non-land-based assets. Yes, industrial policy is fundamentally important. He has developed a good critique of the Washington Consensus, which denies the need for the industrial policy. Unfortunately, it's horribly wrong, primarily because all those countries which have developed, including the developed countries, have had an industrial policy. America could not have developed its electronic industries without having a liberal industrial policy where huge grants were given to places like Princeton, Harvard, and Stanford to develop newer technologies. And those technologies were then shared with multinationals. So up to 40% of Harvard University's electronic funds come in from the federal government. Thus to say that there is no industrial policy even in the most developed countries is, is really not correct. And, and then he's talked about national banks. This is very important. In this country, fortunately, we have something like 80% of the savings, 80% of the banking is done by national banks. And the foreign banks are not really finding it meaningful to be here to an extent that Citibank has left this country. And I think there is only one bank left which is doing uh, the retail banking, which is the standard chartered bank. Everybody, everybody else has left because uh, they didn't find it meaningful. And that's something uh, which is something which this, this country should be working upon. Finally, we talk about governance. This is critical. None of these things like industrial policy or value-added uh, industrialization or uh, basic services would happen unless we have good governance, for which decentralization, for which control at a, uh, I would say, a strong monitoring and evaluation system and transparency, all of these are so fundamentally important. The one thing which he probably has implicit in his mind is how to bring in transparency when the judiciary is 30 years behind time. We get the judgments which are 10 years behind time. So we can't have justice unless the judicial system works. That means, again, a part of the good governance. I, I recall one book which, was, which I had read uh, some 15 years back. It was written by Raghuram Rajan and Zingales. It's called How to Save Capitalism from Capitalists. Now, this book talks about the fact that capitalists will always try to destroy capitalism. <laughs> 
by bringing in increased monopoly. And we have to save capitalism by having institutions which are stronger than the industrialists or the capitalists. Now, this was published in the United States and became one of the best sellers, primarily because it's talking about a country whose institutions had started becoming weak and, and it became a major issue there how to strengthen institutions. Finally, I would like to point out one thing which is very important, and this is something which we had a discussion with the World Bank when I was working with the UNDP a long time back, that at that time they had said Africa and Latin America are doing very well. This is the early part of the century. And uh, they said the growth rate is 5, 6, 7 percent. I said, listen, there's a serious problem there. You're talking about a growth rate of mining and digging. While we want my uh, growth coming in from human effort. They were un very unhappy, and it was a public meeting like this, and when we made a statement against interna an international organization, they, they felt uh, you know, pretty much humiliated. Uh, I don't know whether humiliated or they were angry. They said, listen, he, he doesn't know economics. I said, sure, I don't know economics, but I know reality. Uh, <laughs> today, we recognize that it's exactly that you can't dig away the earth and sell it. And even countries like Saudi Arabia, which are ultra conservative, are going into diversification of their economy. They are having their graduates trained in Harvard and Princeton and coming back for the industrialization into non oil sectors in Saudi Arabia. So it is being increasingly recognized even in the most resource-based industries. I would just say one more thing, that in all countries, all, and this is underlined in the recent past, population has been a major factor. All these countries has ha have had a total fertility rate having touched two or less before they took off, which means higher savings rate, more women's participation in the labor force, more workers in the labor force creating value. We don't talk about population policies in the same tone as we talk about development. And it is fundamentally important that demography becomes a part of, of development. And similarly, we don't talk about, we haven't talked about ecology for a very long time. We have to also talk about ecology, which I think Santosh's book in one of the later epilogues does talk about it. And uh, that's, that's a very welcome thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Acharya. May I now invite His Excellency, Mr. Federico Salas Lothfe, Ambassador of Mexico to India, for his remarks on the subject. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want my first words to be words of thanks to the, uh, the Nero Memorial Museum and Library for hosting us uh, here today. Um, and you know, the presence of all of you, particularly my colleagues, ambassadors from Latin America that are here, I'm very glad that you could make the time to be uh, with us. Uh, and in this, um, in, I, I don't know if we, we should call it a presentation or an introduction of the Spanish version of the book, uh, but I'm very happy that, uh, that we have now the Spanish version of this book because I think that uh, it brings us, as, as it has been said both by uh, <coughs> Professor uh, Mejrotra and uh, Mr. Acharya, the, uh, it brings us some uh, good lessons that can be learned and that should be shared between the regions of Latin America and, and Asia. Uh, the book, as, as has been said, was translated into the Spanish by the National Autonomous University of Mexico and the University of Guadalajara. Uh, this latter one is a, uh, a, uh, one of the main states universities in Mexico. And of course, the National University stands out as one of the most prominent uh, universities in Latin America with a history of over 500 years. Both universities are widely recognized in Mexico for their social and economic studies. Uh, I also want to recognize the fact that Professor Mejrotra has, uh, has had an extensive uh, relationship certainly with many countries in Latin America, but I'm, I, I would like to highlight that with Mexico, it has been a, a, a very fruitful relationship. He participated, for example, as a speaker in the Guadalajara International Book Fair uh, three years ago, three and a half years ago, uh, 
um, when India was the guest of honor of this uh, book fair in 2019. And also, and I take the opportunity to thank him for his participation in, an, in a uh, book that was published by the Mexican Diplomatic Academy upon the 70th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between Mexico and India. And he wrote an article on the potential for strengthening social programs in both countries, uh, highlighting experiences that we can share in this area and our differences and similarities um, of the, given the size of our, of our economies. I think that uh, one thing that has, um, that has been said, and, I, it, 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 and it, it, it should be emphasized, is that there is a lot that we can learn from each other as regions, that, that Latin America can learn from Asia, and that Asia can also learn from Latin America. Um, questions such as um, how to address deficit in infrastructure, uh, coordinate uh, progress in trade facilitation, industrial policies, uh, the incorporation of diaspora and business abroad in trade promotion, uh, the issues of inequality and social concerns in establishing programs that uh, concern the most vulnerable social sectors, accountability and transparency, amongst other issues that certainly are the ones that, um, that we can uh, share and, uh, as I said, learn from each other. Uh, and this, of course, doesn't have to do just with the past, with, with what has been the experience of our development, both in Latin America and in Asia, and particularly in, in India, in the past decades. But we should also be looking ahead uh, towards the future, both our regions, and to see how best we can um, sort of like, you know, compare notes as how, how best we can, what are the best things that we can do to support the, the or, and, and face the challenges and opportunities that our, <coughs> our development has for, for both of us. Questions such as digital, digitalization, all the issues of innovation, uh, the question of the rural sector that was, uh, that was addressed is something that, we, that you know, comes from the past, but that certainly has uh, still uh, um, uh, a lot of weight in the present, and, uh, and certainly nearshoring which is something that has, uh, in the in the past uh, couple of years, become you know a very important a very important issue. I uh, I welcome the fact that this kind of studies are taking place and that, that they are being supported by Indian institutions. I am a firm believer that both uh, India and the Latin American countries that we can benefit, as I said, from sharing this type of experiences from, uh, uh, and, and also from sharing our common vision as to how to face the, the future years. There's still a lot of work to be done in terms of, uh, of development in, in both our, uh, our, our respective countries. And I think that there is much that we can, as I said, you know, uh, benefit from each other. If we keep this dialogue open, if we continue to exchange ideas, and, uh, and have uh, forums such as the ones that, uh, that, that brings us here today to, uh, to see exactly what, uh, you know, how best we can move forward and address these challenges for the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. May I now request NMML Director Sri Sanjeev Nandan Sahai to make his remarks, sir. Your Excellency, the Ambassador from Mexico, Ambassadors from Cuba, Chile, Ecuador, and Costa Rica, Professor Merotra, Dr. Sathya Acharya, Deputy Director, Dr. Ravi Mishra, colleagues. I am a practitioner of public policy, and <clears throat> it's it's a you know it's it's amazing to learn from Professor Merotra. I heard his first lecture in this uh, hall a few week, months ago, and he's consistent in his theoretical framework of analysis of development in which he emphasizes, and if I may say, human development as prerequisite for economic growth, even though he's shown arrows going in bidirectionally, but if I were to even further simplify it, then human development as a prerequisite to economic growth. 
What was very fascinating in the lecture is that he started by saying that these countries got independence about 200 years ago. Political independence is what I understand because it would appear from his lecture that economic independence is yet to come in a, in a substantial manner. I don't know if that's correct or not, but if the foreign banks dominate and it's an extractive industry uh, where foreign capital exists, then to me it would seem that in some manner that there is still the rupture, a complete rupture with the economic relations has not happened and uh, there is colonialism in another form. I think Professor Maharotra in my mind summed up everything when he says that FDI sought human capital in East and South, Southeast Asia and it sought extraction of natural resources in Latin American countries. And that's why that is the stark difference that we see. But I, I, I think it must have been answered, this question that I'm going to pose. I have not had the opportunity of reading the book. Why is it in Latin America is a huge continent with so many countries? Why have all the countries broadly followed the same trajectory the same path of economic development, same political and economic policies, similar, I should not use same. And why is it that there's been no breakout? Furthermore, what are the institutional reasons why these have happened? Because the literature on economic development, the different models are there to see. Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, they are, they are visible. And there's enough literature. Why is it that this did not happen in Latin American countries? And why is it that the extractive industries continue? Why is it that education in higher and technical education did not happen? Even in India, which had gained independence, very quickly investments were made in IITs, in medical, higher medical sciences. Yes, as Professor Acharya has said, you know, at municipal education, village level school education, uh, you know, we still have to think about the quality, but there was recognition of the fact that we do need higher and technical, higher education of, of a world standard, technical education of world standard. So these are some of my comments, but I found his lecture extremely fascinating and thank you, Professor Nagarajan. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we are now open to questions and comments, but please be very brief. Kindly introduce yourself before you ask the question. Professor Kamtekar. Um, so I'm Indivar Kamtekar, a senior fellow here. This is a very interesting talk, and it obviously raises questions and um, a request for further information. So uh, here are two questions. First, if salvation lies in uh, manufacturing, if one goes with that, then what are the implications for your analysis of the service sector? How does the service sector and its trajectory in East Asia compare with that in the Latin American countries which you, um, uh, which you have in mind? The second thing would be, since savings are so crucial, is there a difference in the culture of savings in East Asia and in Latin America? And if so, uh, how would you analyze that? We'll take a couple of questions before they are answered. Yes, please. Please come up, sir, and uh, just use the mic. I'm uh, Arun Kumar. Uh, you know, I'm sure you would have dealt with it in the book. Uh, you said there's a lot of inequality which means the highest income people have a very large share of the income. And because they have a higher savings propensity, the savings propensity of the country should be very high. But you imply that the savings propensity is very low. Now, does that link up to the flight of capital, which you know Latin America is known for from the 60s, that there's a huge amount of flight of capital? Uh, and that would then mean that the investment would be less. The second factor would be the terms of trade. 
the terms of trade have been shifting against the Latin American countries for a very long time, which means the surplus retained in the economy would be low, and that would also lead to lower investment levels. So I'm sure you would have dealt with this. The third aspect would be the uh, U.S. presence. You know, the, the Latin America, the, uh, you know, sort of uh, back uh, of the, you know, uh, U.S. And therefore, there's been pressure. Like, you know, if you see Paul Baran's book, you know, it talks about the multinationals and how they have, you know, uh, pressed down on the Latin American scene. And that is very different from South East Asia. Because in Southeast Asia, the idea was to stop communism, and therefore there's a lot of help, a lot of access to capital, a lot of access to markets. But that wasn't the case in uh, Latin America. So I'm sure you would have dealt with some of these questions if you could you know, tell us more about it. I think you can answer before we go for the next round. Thank you very much for those uh, quite excellent questions. And they were. Um, uh, let me deal with your second question about the culture of savings. Is that different between East Asia and uh, Latin America? I find this whole argument about culture of saving or culture of anything, uh, with all due respect, rather spurious. The, I think I explained in my presentation rather briefly, but I do it in, in, at, at greater length in the book, that Unfortunately, we've got a, f a pattern of financial development in Latin America, which is in complete contrast to the way it has evolved either in India or in the most of the East Asian countries. I said this very briefly. You can have uh, financial development uh, with, with, the, uh, with sort of obviously banks are up, uh, dominating. And in most developing countries, in the entire global south, ba banks tend to be uh, the biggest players within the financial sector. Now, if that's the case, then we've got to see what is their, you know, institutional ownership. You can have either private ownership or public ownership. If it's private ownership, it could be foreign owned or it could be domestically privately owned. Now, what we have is privately owned and mostly foreign owned. I'm not for a moment suggesting, please don't get me wrong, most countries in the region have obviously a fair number of private banks, uh, domestic ones, and they also have public sector development banks. So BNDES of Brazil is a very you know, well-established institution. In fact, BNDES has, despite the neoliberal domination of thinking since the early 80s, it, it didn't cease to exist. It continued to exist in, in Brazil. We actually started out with development finance institutions, public sector uh, development finance institutions, and we let them go. And then we've had to think about resuming them most recently. The bottom line in the world is that if the banking network was widespread, and there were sufficient rural banks. Now, why would you tell me why would private foreign banks have any interest in spreading out into, into the rural areas? They don't. Huh? They're essentially servicing the relatively well-off national capital, and they are servicing the foreign companies. And which is one reason why domestic savings are not being mobilized. So you have too few banks in the, in the rural areas. So too few people saving in the bank. That means the vast majority of the population, if I'm saying in Mexico, which is at, a, at the threshold of becoming a high-income country for many, for many years, there the 35, there's only 35 to 40% bank, meaning bank account ownership. Of course, in the last most recent years, nine, to, you know, five to ten percent additional people have acquired, you know, the, the 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 online banking thing. That that has certainly grown and it's grown everywhere. But the fact of the matter is, where is the savings being held? Now, this is big problem number one. I connect con entirely to Arun's point. He's absolutely spot on, and I had this in my presentation for shortage of time. Of course, I discussed this in the book. There is a fair bit of, uh, of the well-off actually you know, taking their capital abroad. If they were, I mean, I, 
let's not for a minute forget that you know a fair bit of that is happening in our country as well has been happening for some time but you know it's nowhere close to the kind of scale that we've seen for the last 30 to 40 years and it doesn't seem to be coming down because you know when i started working on latin america in the 90s i I, I, I remember the savings rate to be in the region of 14, you know, 15 to 20%. <laughs> I see some change since then in the most recent period, but not very much, which sort of leaves me in a state of shock. I mean, I'm in an equal state of shock for India that, you know, despite the fact that our per capita income has quadrupled between 1991 when our economic reforms began, and now our tax to GDP ratio has not risen, but our savings rate has risen dramatically. We are, okay, we are not at China levels of savings, but because of the public sector bank's penetration in throughout the country, there is massive mobilization of, of ordinary people's savings in the banks, and which has only increased once, you know, I mean, until 2013-14, we had about 50% of the total number of households in our country which had bank accounts. Today, that number is shot up to somewhere between 70 and 80 percent. At our level of per capita income, that's a hugely important. So this is, you know, I'm connecting um, the two points. On terms of trade, Arun, have been shifting against Latin America. You know, by and large, we've lived with this singer Prebish hypothesis. Raul Prebish was the earliest Secretary General of ECLAC, uh, and we all grew up learning about, you know, Professor Sunanda Sen is smiling. I was one of her students, at, she's a professor in JNU. Um, we all grew up with, you know, Singapore. Pradesh. But the bottom line, Arun, is then, in a, in a, in a situation where, at least since the post, the global economic crisis, 100 countries of the world, Angtad tells us 100 countries of the world have adopted industrial policy. How many of the Latin American countries have? I'm not for a moment suggesting that Brazil doesn't have a, a sort of in, uh, implicit industrial policy. Otherwise, how would empires being bought, made, and how would empires be being imported by India? Uh, the, the, the aircraft, the, the small, small, small. Having said that, but you know, this is the one-off example. It, this, this is the problem. So the prop, and in fact, I should add, it's not just that post-2008, uh, industrial policy ceased being a bad word. Post-COVID, there has been an, another surge in you know, emphasis on, on industrial policy, including in the United States. Why aren't countries like India, or for that matter, most of Latin America, thinking about this? So if your dependence continues to be Arun, on extractive industry, then why are you surprised that you are facing, you know, terms of trade uh, which, is, which is going against you? So, you know, ultimately, in the last analysis, we've got to look inward. We can't keep blaming the rest of the world. The rest of the world is what it is. If we don't fix ourselves, then I don't have to say more. <laughs> yeah, there was a question from there. Please come up and use the mic. I'm Kim. Yeah. Just switch on the mic, please. Professor Mehutra, it was really an intellectually stimulating uh, presentation. And uh, my question is, well, you, it was very interesting to know about the role of foreign banks in Latin America. But what has been the role of the regulators? What has been the role of the, uh, the other e equivalent of the Reserve Bank in Latin, in Latin American countries? That is number one. In your presentation, I did not find the issue of corruption. Is that not an issue in Latin American uh, economies? Uh, and number three, is there any relationship between political instability and growth and development of Latin American countries? Thank, Thank you. you. Any other question? Yes. Uh, Professor yeah. mm. well, uh, I thought, you know, there are three major uh, aspects on which uh, uh, Professor Malhotra has uh, highlighted. Uh, the first one is that these countries did not pursue industrialization and extractive products 
were exported, and that was their mainstay. And the second one is about <coughs> resources, that, you know, resources from the banks, uh, well, uh, I think you have talked about the foreign banks, the, uh, uh, you know, importance of the foreign banks. Now here, I just want to connect uh, to some of my ideas on these things. Uh, one is that, uh, well, where is, uh, whether industrialization in these countries, all consistently, they have been, since the debt crisis of 1982, they had been following the uh, structural adjustment. I mean, not only Brazil, but uh, the other two countries as well. And uh, in the process, uh, and finally, you know, to come to very recent uh, period, well, uh, after the pandemic, the uh, quantitative expansion has started, uh, and the uh, Federal Reserve is raising the rate of interest, and therefore all these countries, including my country, uh, will, we have to raise the rate of interest in order to attract capital. And then when they give it up, uh, the, uh, which is called <laughs> taper tantrum, uh, in that situation, you know, we, uh, we just do not know how, uh, you know, we'll keep our money and so on. Anyway, the point I was trying to make <laughs> is that all through consistently policy had been guided by, neo I th I'm sure you'll agree, by neoliberal policies. And so they didn't have any opportunity, more or less, to build up their economy with industry and with more employment, uh, which is uh, worth it, and you know, some reduction of poverty. I think it stopped here. Thank you. Please go ahead. Ambassador. Hello, my name is Claudio Sorena. I'm the ambassador of Costa Rica, and also an economist and uh, work in the World Bank before, and the Inter-American Development Bank. And uh, uh, having uh, heard um, Dr. Santosh uh, Mehrota uh, presentation, uh, I definitely um, find it uh, very uh, stimulating for uh, a discussion and a debate that is uh, very much needed in, in our countries and also in, in Asia. When I came to India, I, I thought that it would be a great experience for me to see the laboratory here in India to understand uh, development policies and what could be um, uh, some lessons for Latin America, definitely. So it, it really uh, uh, interests me to, to come and listen to you. Um, however, uh, seeing that you, you are based theoretically on, on, on authors that I definitely disagree with, like Lucas and, uh, um, and um, what were the other ones, um, uh, Romer, uh, which come from a neoclassical perspective uh, in, in economics. I definitely have uh, a lot of uh, issues with, with that perspective, uh, coming myself from a more political economy perspective, where I see that um, it is important to understand the history, first of all, of the different processes that came along to understand why we are here, um, and the institutional structures that it was created during that process, the historical process. For example, um, in Latin America, you have a process uh, that is very different from the from United States. Uh, you know, if we think that development is being close or similar to the United States, which is one of the problems that, uh, that I see uh, behind that perspective. Uh, and also not understanding that development and growth is not the same thing. Uh, if you think that United States is a developed country, you have to re remember that United States has uh, like 50 million people in poverty. Huh? And it's the most developed capitalist economy in the world. Huh? So they haven't been able either to solve the poverty problem or the inequality problem that has increased. So in that case, uh, let's, let's take away this image that United States is like the ideal model that we should follow, that we should all follow. That's the first thing that I, I, I disagree with. Secondly, um, the institutional structure is based on a political and power structure that is completely absent from the analysis. 
And if you don't include the political structure and the power structure that is in each country, either or in each region, Latin America and Asia, you won't be able to understand what was the, the reasons for development or why are we here in this, in this situation right now. So the political structure and the power structure is what it may uh, answer the question of why didn't Latin America have an industrial policy? And why did all of the policies benefit some sectors and not others? No? And, um, and that leads me to uh, make a very kind of a, maybe radical conclusion and ask you, because I have been able to, to, to think about it a little bit also, uh, is poverty necessary for capitalist development? Is there a rate of poverty that is necessary to maintain the status quo of this political structure that uh, hinders on the development in economic policies? So I, I leave it at there, and uh, I would like to, um, if, if there's a, a, more discussion, then I'll, I'll do more. Thank you. We have a question from the ambassador here also. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am the ambassador for Chile, Juan Angulo, but I am economist by profession as well. Uh, I will not be so radical as my colleague from um, Costa Rica, but some of the things that have been said here are, you know, I think a comment. Um, uh, what, a, a, a comment, comments are comment. more, more, yes, because uh, in, it has been said that uh, we should go on the industrialist uh, policy um, as a kind of solution of uh, problems. I totally agree with my colleague that the political factor should be considered and was absent on the discussion because um, all the uh, uh, economic uh, policies are insert, are a reflection of the ideology. That is a word very important in Latin America which is one of the regions the more uh, ideologized of the, of the world. Uh, much more, I think, than, uh, than Southeast Asia. So that is uh, factor number one. Factor number two is that, of course, Raul Prebisch, the Argentinian ECLAC uh, uh, Secretary General, was uh, uh, promoting the in forced industrialization through substitution of imports. Well, some, several, countries, um, several countries implemented that policy, and the result, they produce very inefficient uh, industrial sectors with a lot of taxes, with a lot of subsidies, with a lot of problems, finally, for the central governments who needed to finance these inefficiencies. Some other countries have, uh, have chosen for a different model. And then uh, my third point uh, on, your, on, on, my, on the comments, uh, in the panel, somebody said that we were always, all, uh, all the countries in the region, following the same path. I totally disagree with that because if you have some uh, differences, uh, region with differences in the development models, is Latin America. You have one extreme neoliberal, neoliberal, more static, extreme on the left, etc. And with different, uh, with different results. I am not saying that one is Best, best, or that is the political choice. Again, the political factor, because this is sustained on, in political reasons. It is not on the theory of uh, some academics uh, group. It's very political. Uh, and, uh, and fourth, I wanted to, to highlight also the timing factor is very important. Uh, I don't know if you have considered the, um, the consistency in the timing in implementing public policies. Sometimes that is much better than the public policy itself in terms that you need consistency and you need um, a policy that will be implemented through different changes in political system, which is also a problem in Latin America because you are going from one extreme to another extreme. Uh, and that is a Latin American um, particularity as well. And um, uh, Yeah, and, 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 and to, to, to finish, um, uh, something uh, Sir mentioned about corruption. It is true, corruption is present in different grades in, in, in Latin America. There is uh, no country is exempt from corruption. But of course, um, um, uh, corruption is one part of, of, of the problem in the decision-making process. And uh, again, um, 
policies uh, should uh, tackle. Uh, I totally agree with with him that uh, this is one of our our, our problems in into uh, develop a, a better decision making system for public policies. So, we're just some some comments on on your on your on the words that was expressed. Yes, please. Would you like to respond? Yeah, indeed, absolutely. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'm extremely grateful to the very rich comments, and uh, this is precisely the kind of commentary I expected, and I'm, I'm enriched by it. Um, I, with, um, with all due respect to my friend uh, <coughs> Mahesh, I'm going to deal with your questions bilaterally, if you don't mind. And I'm going to give slight priority to our, uh, our ambassadors and our foreign friends in particular. Um, and of course, uh, to my former teacher, Professor San. Um, let me, uh, and, but I'll bring in Professor San's commentary about neoliberalism uh, into, into my responses to the uh, excellencies ambassadors of Costa Rica and Chile. Um, first, let me say, sir, in response to you, is that Lucas and Roma are not driving much of my analysis at all. Most of my analysis was being driven by San and Nussbaum, the capabilities approach. So I can assure you, it's only the emphasis that Lucas and Roma put on the importance of education and the importance of you know, the innovation, uh, dom domestic innovation that is generated by the whole focus on investment that Lucas and Roma talk about. So it's only to that extent, I can assure you. My second def defense, in a sense, to, to, in respect of uh, the fact that I don't discuss ideology, the political factor, and, and, and so on, uh, is that I actually said in, in, in my sort of very second slide that I, institutional economics is very much a driving force of my analysis. I couldn't possibly have dealt with all of this in, the, in, the, in a matter of 15 minutes, but you'll see it actually dr uh, in the book uh, that, 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 is in, that hopefully you'll have a chance to read. And by the way, I should add that it's an open source book it's available to all students, faculty, everyone, and which is wonderful. And I, I forgot to sort of thank UNAM. Of course, UNAM did a brilliant job of, of this. Uh, uh, and I'm really, really grateful. And I think not too many people sitting in this room may, may know that UNAM is not just Mexico's premier university. It is the preeminent, in many ways, the preeminent university in Latin America. And students from all across Latin America actually aspire to enter UNAM, and so when word spread uh, to all my friends that, you know, UNAM had, was publishing my book, I was truly, truly amazed at the kind of response I got. Um, and of course, the second biggest university is Guadalajara, and I want to thank them as well. But let me return to the, the substantive point. Not for a moment, sir, would I su say that, you know, U.S. is any model. I agree with you entirely. I mean, so there is nothing, no disagreement bet between us. I didn't think that was even implied in any, anything. I should, however, in fact, tell you something that you have not shared with you, which is that I've actually, you know, when I was uh, researching a book in the mid-90s, when I used to be based in New York, which, uh, a, book, which I, a book which I did mention, Development with a Human Face, published by Oxford. I chose about 10 countries from across the globe, countries from the global south, which had achieved for their level of per capita income extremely high levels of human development and amazing social outcome indicators. And I tell you, the two countries I happened to choose, I'm privileged to find that the two ambassadors from those two countries are right, right here, Costa Rica and Cuba. Uh, for those of you who are not so familiar with Costa Rica, you should know that this is a country which has had a history of democracy, which is very unusual. I mean, I'm talking pol political structures here. And I, I talk about it in the book. Which has had a democracy for 150 years. 
right? This is a very unusual country, one. Secondly, it has not had an army for something around the same period. And this is one of the reasons why it has managed on account of the focus. I mean, there are political economy factors which, of course, drive Costa Rica's uh, investments in human capital. And the important and interesting thing that I, I realized when I was writing that book is precisely because Costa Rica is one of these uh, very unusual countries with a, re a special focus on, on, on human development. Um, it has also, a rel relatively, relatively speaking to other countries, experienced more sustained GDP growth also, an argument that I've actually uh, make in, in the book. Now, on the argument um, that you made is, is poverty necessary for capitalist development? Uh, well, I would agree, disagree very strongly with that. I mean, it might appear so, but the fact of the matter is that one of the reasons I, I argue in the book that most of the countries in Latin America have faced volatility in growth and not sustained GDP growth in the way the East Asians did is precisely because there was, I mean, poverty was high, and at the same time, uh, because the, the reliance on the extractive sector, and, and to that extent, you know, even Costa Rica is not that different, the reliance on the extractive sectors was so great in the overall export structure or in the GDP that you were, relevant, you were vulnerable to exogenous shocks in a way that you, ca you can't escape those exogenous shocks because you're so well integrated into the international economy. One of the ways that you know, most <coughs> of the Southeast Asians actually managed to avoid volatility in their growth rate and experience sustained GDP growth was precisely that they only gradually built up their export capacity and, 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 and you know, integrated in the international market. Uh, so the big difference that strikes you about the two is, is that precisely as, you know, because it was labor intensive growth that was taking place in most of Southeast and East Asia, poverty was falling. Yes, some, some inequality was increasing, but poverty was falling. You don't see the, uh, a systematic le decline in poverty in most of the Latin American countries. And that's where, that's a source, as I'm arguing, for the volatility in the growth rate, because you can have peaks in growth because you know, a commodity, international commodity prices have increased. And then suddenly when the international commodity prices decline, you, know, you go back to, to, the, uh, to, to, to slowing growth, rising poverty, and you know, a, a sustained situation where you go in and out of growth, which is not sustained. And therefore, in that situation, you can't sustain uh, poverty reduction. It's not possible to sustain poverty reduction, which is exactly what, has happened, what this century has shown. Now, uh, Ambassador from Chile said, um, the import substituting strategies that were adopted in the 1960s, 70s, were led to very inefficient uh, industrial development. Fair enough, it's true. A correction was needed, no question about it. And we certainly in India, unfortunately sustained this ISI model right all the way through the 1980s. And we paid the price for it because we missed the boat, like unlike the East Asians, uh, on the labor-intensive manufacturing growth, which has in fact trapped us into a pattern of growth since 1990, which is slightly, majorly problematic, I would say. I, I don't have the time to go into our problems in, in this seminar. But all I'm, I, dis, I don't have any disagreement with you, except that it's not that we could have done without the import substituting industrialization strategy, period. The 30, 40, even the East Asians did that. There's no escaping that. They, but when did they exit from it? I think there's a real difference here between us and them. And 
they managed to sort of shift away from, because they didn't sort of protect their infant industries for longer than was necessary. Many of us protected our infant industries for longer than was necessary and we paid the price for that. So I'm no proponent for the, for the Washington consensus on neoliberal policy, but, and there's no question that, you know, they forced all, many countries around the globe, especially in Latin America and Africa, to open up too rapidly, reduce tariffs too quickly, and they, we all paid the price for it. Even we did. Uh, so all I'm saying is that we have to make sure that our policymakers are actually making the shifts in policy at the right time, which is required by global environment. Thank you. In the interest of time, I'm not going to sort of carry on any longer, uh, we, because this is, of course, a very, very interesting topic. And thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it has been a, a marvelous uh, discussion on this very important book, Social and Economic Policies for Reducing Poverty in Latin America Are There Lessons, lessons from Asia? Uh, Professor Merotra has made the important point that the Latin American economies have been over-dependent on extractive industries, and that has somehow distorted the growth model in a fundamental way over the long run, and it has reduced the capacity of those economies to eliminate or reduce poverty. Of course, there is a larger question, which I'm sure he is going to consider in the future, as to why the Latin American countries were over-dependent on the extractive industries. Are there historical reasons behind that dependence? That is a question that needs to be explored. And uh, I take this opportunity to thank all the distinguished guests who are present today. And I thank, once again, the chief guest of today's uh, program, His Excellency, Ambassador Federico Salas Lotfe, the Honorable Ambassador of Mexico to India, Professor Sarthi Acharya, who very kindly accepted uh, our invitation to be a discussant. I thank uh, Professor Santosh Merotra, and I thank our director, Sri Sanjeev Nandan Sahai, and other ambassadors, Honorable Ambassador of Chile, <coughs> Costa Rica, and other places, and all the other distinguished guests for their presence and participation in the discussion this afternoon. Thank you very much, and tea is waiting for us outside.